Welcome to Timeless with Vivek Nitur. Our guest today is Professor H. Narayanan. Professor H. Narayanan is Professor Emeritus at the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Bombay. His research interests include combinatorial optimization, including submodular function theory, topological methods for the efficient analysis of electrical networks, VLSI optimization problems, such as large scale system partitioning and building large scale circuit simulators. Professor Narayanan has been a faculty member at the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Bombay since 1974 and has been a visiting faculty at the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at the University of California, Berkeley from 1983 to 1985. Professor Narayanan earned a B.Tech and Ph.D. in Electrical Engineering from IIT Bombay in 1969 and 1974 respectively. I am very excited about Professor Narayanan being our guest today because I have been his student at IIT Bombay. Good afternoon, sir. How have you been? I have been fine. As you know, I am retired. So retirement keeps me very busy. Sir, how have your memories been of, of having been an undergraduate student at IIT Bombay? Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> it's a long time ago, uh, but by and large, I have only pleasant memories of the whole thing because that is a time when uh, major things happened uh, as far as my, if I might say so, intellectual development is concerned. Um, I joined the department in 1964 as a 16-year-old. I should say not the department, I joined the institute. Uh, in those days, the first two years was a common program. The third year onwards, we had courses from the department. Uh, my memory of those days is uh, that we were very, very busy. Whether we were studying hard, I'm not very sure. But then we were kept busy because we had classes all the time. We had labs, we had journals and the like. So I think uh, by and large, in those days, the coursework and the lab work was more than the present generation undergoes. I'm not saying that the quality of the education nowadays is any way worse than those, but that was the tradition. Uh, and then, as far as my undergraduate uh, studies were concerned, I was uh, not a serious student in the sense of having a strong desire for learning. Uh, I used to sort of prepare for exams the way IIT students do and do reasonably well. And uh, I would have probably continued like this for some time. And in fact, I did do that for the first two years. But when I went into the third year uh, and joined the department, there were departmental courses. And uh, I was very unsatisfied with the way I was uh, dealing with them. Uh, I, In fact, uh, if you ask me the contents of a course in the next semester, I would have forgotten what it was and so on. So I said that perhaps the problem is that I am interested in something else, so I will try. One of my difficulties was that subjects were, uh, for me, not very rigorous. Uh, each step did not follow from the previous step, in my opinion. Uh, this receipt did not seem to bother my classmates to the same extent, uh, so I was not sure exactly what was going on. Uh, what I did was, I said, I'll set myself a program on my own and see whether I can move to another subject after graduation. The first thing I did was to try physics. In the fourth year, first semester, I went through the first volume of Feynman's lectures and they did not appeal to me. Now, I could see that he's very, very good, but the subject itself did not appeal to me because it had the same difficulty. I faced the same difficulty that I faced in electrical engineering, namely that each step did not follow strongly from the previous step. In the next semester, I tried uh, reading abstract algebra. I read a book or maybe one and a half uh, volumes of a three volume set on abstract algebra by Nathan Jacobson. And I was extremely satisfied with the way the my understanding improved with the subject. 
See, one of the difficulties that we used to face in those days was that our maths courses were not very formal. They were full of clever tricks. And if you knew the tricks, you could score marks. Uh, it was not as though we had a deep understanding of mathematics. And that sort of thing carried over also into subjects when you don't understand a subject very well. One way is really to isolate portions which are difficult, bring out some sort of axioms so that we can uh, forget about the insights of a black box and proceed with the interaction between these black boxes into which you can break the subject. Now, for this, one of the things that is important is that you should be able to define things formally and carefully. Now, that was not there in our education until then. Nowadays, uh, by the way, uh, maybe within a five years of our uh, leaving, this sort of thing had happened all over the country. I think things were a little bit more formal. Maybe some people criticize it also as a way of teaching maths. It's supposed to be not so good and so on. But the point is that it did uh, matter as far as defining things carefully was concerned. So this abstract algebra helped me to define things carefully. I also went through uh, a book which was lent to me very kindly my, by my teacher, Professor K. Shankar, uh, by Seishu and Reed called Linear Graphs and Electrical Circuits. And I went through it very carefully. It was the first book on applications of graph theory to electrical engineering, as far as I know. Um, and it is a very important book because it actually defined certain things carefully. Uh, circuit theory, for instance, is derived very formally there. And I was very happy reading it. I read it very carefully, spent enormous amount of time on it. In fact, uh, uh, fourth and fifth year, I probably spent more time on my own program rather than on the department program. Because the moment I come back from the department, I would start doing these things. So it did not bother me as far as the exams were concerned, because I used to prepare for exam more or less the same way as I did earlier. And I never missed classes. So there were no serious difficulties just because I got interested in another thing. Then I worked out uh, uh, for my home paper, I worked out some three or four open problems in Seishu and Reed. And I was fairly happy with my understanding of the subject. And I think it did improve my overall feeling of uh, security with uh, electric engineering subjects, and particularly with circuit theory. Circuit theory is one of the subjects which is not very difficult to uh, axiomatize. And there are some issues there which uh, one must understand. And they did bother me initially. Uh, I could tell you one or two of them. Uh, in my third year, I remember the teacher did something like this. He was an outstanding teacher. Uh, so I'm not really criticizing him. It was the balanced three-phase circuit with four wires. Uh, so he proved that the current through the fourth wire, that is a neutral wire, is zero. Then he said something like this. So this wire does not carry current. So I have it there. So we'll remove it. And his point was that it doesn't make any difference to the solution of the circuit. And I was very uncomfortable, I remember. And this is something that had I known how to define things properly, I would not have found that hard. The thing that happens really is that if you think of the circuits as a uh, set of constraints, Kirchhoff current law, Kirchhoff voltage law, and device characteristics, if you think of it like that, then you can see that the first circuit is not really the same as the second circuit. The first circuit had a wire between two nodes, which may or may not have carried current, but there was a wire. Now you have removed the wire. So what can happen is that when you remove something, it is possible that theoretically at least the set of solutions changes. Because after all, the wire is doing two jobs. One is to carry current from one node to another, and the other is to force the two potentials to be the same. Now only one of the things is being, is being taken care of in the sense that the current through it was zero before and after. But the voltage is being the same has not been taken care of. So it has to be proved separately. Now, this is the sort of thing that used to bother me. One more thing that used to bother me as an undergraduate enormously is the use of potential at all in machine theory and so on. I used to think that you are not supposed to use machines in uh, when changing magnetic field is there. You're not supposed to use potential. So how are you using? Now, this sort of thing actually can be handled by 
kind of saying that the flux is largely enclosed inside a surface and then we are not measuring inside the loops that we are using are all external to the circuit and so on and also there is one more problem and that outside there are changing electric field now when there is changing electric field there will also be changing magnetic field but this effect is fairly minor so these are the sort of issues that one must settle for oneself and i was i remember i was uncomfortable about these things in those days i mean it got settled after some time but it took time so as far as undergraduate thing is concerned i don't remember those subjects too well but i do remember the program that i set for myself i remember extremely well i even now know seshu and read reasonably well i think jacobson's uh, one and a half volume that i read i still know moderately well i was never seriously interested in mathematics for its own sake i did not know this beforehand that i would not finding that interesting what helped me was the matter of definitions and things like that kind and therefore i could carry over these definitions to my subjects it's not as though a group or something like that plays a very big role in circuit theory but the fact that you have formally defined something you have derived it you can do a similar thing in the case of circuits so this is the sort of thing that i have been doing most of the time uh, i have for for instance formalized parts of circuit theory which i want to understand particularly the topological circuit theory i have formalized it i have axiomatized it and then i have derived theorems and so on and always with the intention that what i do should be strongly linked to circuits so this sort of keeps me on track and it has kept me happy i would not have been able to do all this if i had not trained myself in a little bit of formal mathematics so that's what i remember about my undergraduate days largely happy days i lived uh, stayed in second hostel last wing first floor i remember the room number also 174 but then uh, it could have changed its name number <laughs> many times afterwards so this part is right i think it will still be the <laughs> last wing and first floor uh, and uh, i had a good time with my friends in those days we used to go for long walks and things of that kind i remember with some fondness all those days so that's more or less my memories about the undergraduate days so did you also stay at hostel 2 during your phd and what are your other memories of hostel 2 in terms of extracurricular activities i am aware of your interest in reading fiction could you also please talk about that sir yeah let me see i remember as an undergraduate my great ambition was not to be a scholar but to play tennis well <laughs> so i was i didn't think i was quite bad at it but i had a tremendous ability to fool myself so <laughs> i used to really try very hard i had an immensely fast service but that's about all i had which probably damaged my shoulder for my size and my other quality of the uh, shots the first service was immensely fast so i used to score my point with the first service and the rest of it used to be pretty bad so i remember that so i used to play tennis but in those days life was very difficult for anything like tennis because the courts were awful they were concrete courts and then uh, the, the balls will be very bad balled balls and there will be a big crowd so you will not get too much of time to yourself or to with your partners that's one thing but i friction reading was too much actually uh, during the first two, two or three years i think i read a little bit too much of friction so it, it, when i in the fourth and fifth year as i mentioned i switched over to these other subjects like a little bit of abstract maths like uh, topology and algebra and graph theory and the like and uh, that time was actually taken away from friction reading and that time was far greater than the amount of time i spent on my regular studies i remember and fiction reading has stayed with me but i don't read uh, make it a point not to read high quality nobel prize winning type of literature i read uh, stuff that is written well but largely of the escapist kind mystery stories science fiction fantasy that kind but quality of writing has to be reasonably good so even now i read about an hour a day so morning i uh, spend 3 uh, to 4 hours on my work and after lunch uh, the rest of the time is supposed to be only on reading novels uh, 
I have begun reading uh, Tamil literature again uh, after a very long, a very a long time later. Uh, the last time I actually read any of it was serious reading of Tamil was when I was perhaps doing PhD or something. So I have read quite a bit in the last month or so. I started with all old favorites like Punin Chelvan by Kalki Krishnamurti. Then I read a number of books by Devan. Uh, and I found them very attractive, actually. So I might even take up a little bit of serious reading of Tamil or ancient Tamil literature now. But let's see. I, on no account will I do something which looks like work for me outside my uh, little bit of work that I do in circuit theory. Uh, I must mention a little bit about it later. I have told you about it. Implicit linear algebra. That's a thing that I'm working on now. So I work on it up to lunch. By that I mean I work on it for about one to two hours up to lunch. And then after that I take off. So mostly it is fiction reading. So this fiction reading has been there with me from school days. Uh, I don't do too much of serious philosophical kind of reading. I have done some of it, but uh, mostly as a kind of break from fiction. Sometimes, even now, I read one author, some 20 books of an author, and then I get fed up and move to a different author. Now, sometimes you can get fed up with fiction and go to more serious reading. I have read, for instance, all of Bill Durant's uh, Story of Civilization. I have read uh, Burton Russell's History of Western Philosophy. I'm not saying that I read them with uh, you know great care or anything like that. I just read them for fun. So that kind of reading I have done, but mostly it was break from fiction. Like even now, fiction is a mainstay. Every day I do quite a bit of reading. So that's more or less my the way I spend my time. I should say I am also trying to memorize Tamil verses with some difficulty, but I am trying. Sir, are these verses from uh, some kind of a Tamil classic uh, literature? Yeah, yeah, mostly classics. Okay. You know, the uh, Shangagalam, as they call it. So the yes. literature from that side. Uh, I'm memorizing more for fun, actually, really. Uh, and the thing that attracts me to all towards all this, uh, particularly literature of the 800 AD and so on, by Arvar and uh, various Nayanars, the literature is understandable. That is interesting because some 1300, 1400 years later, you are still able to understand that language. Earlier literature is a bit harder. Uh, you know, Aghananuru and Purananuru, those are a bit harder. But even that can be made sense of. And nowadays you get, uh, I have books. And uh, also online, these are available with meaning and so on. So it's not very hard. Tamil is actually worth pursuing. It's got its own uh, strengths and weaknesses. And it is fantastic at handling ambiguity. So sometimes poetry gains by ambiguity. And Tamil is good at it, actually. It's meant for ambiguity, I think. That sounds very interesting, sir. Sir, how was your childhood and schooling like? Uh, I went to a school called South Indian Education Society. It was in King Circle. It was one of the largest schools uh, in Mumbai, Bombay, in those days maybe between 3,000 and 4,000 students, very large number. Uh, it is a very traditional South Indian school in the sense that children should be, you know, seen and not heard, that kind. There wasn't a playground. So, but I must say that the teachers are very dedicated and some of them are very good. I remember we had a maths teacher who was excellent. Uh, we used to call him Narayan sir. He was really very good. You could give him any rider and out will come the answer, actually. Very smart man. Uh, so I remember, uh, it was, of course, a bit difficult, you know. I was staying in uh, Santa Cruz in those days. I had to travel by train to King Circle. Uh, you had to change at Bandra and take another train and so on. But I had a friend who used to stay in Goregaon. So while coming back, at least, we used to come back together. So it was good fun. I had to get down at Car Road. Car Road, see, the stations are King Circle, Mahim, Bandra, you change. And then uh, you take a Western Railway train, which goes towards Borivili and so on. So the next station after Bandra is car. So I used to get down at car and walk for about 20 minutes or so to my house. So that was the way it was. Uh, I, my picture of uh, those days is they stretched enormously. The first 15 years of my life, 
probably lasted far more than the rest of my life. Enormous amount of time goes very slowly. And of course, you can do more things during that time, I think, because you're learning or something like that. So your awareness of the world is, uh, everything is, uh, you know, done in slow motion, I think. So it takes a lot of time. And after that, I find 10 years go by in a jiffy. In those days, 10 years was a lot, actually. So uh, pleasant days. Uh, and then I must say that at home, we had fantastic number of books. My father was a great scholar. He had his, done his MA in maths and Sanskrit. And he would spend, he was a government servant, and he would spend something like 25% of his salary on books. So he had variety. We had a huge number of books. Uh, classical fiction, yes. In addition, philosophy, religion, comparative religion, then uh, maths, of course, quite a lot, because he was an amateur mathematician. So it was a very interesting time in those days. And you could discuss anything with him, although he would not talk too much. He would respond. And he would never tell us uh, the right way of doing things. He'll just let me and mildly correct if he thinks that something has to be changed. Very, I think uh, he influenced me a lot in the sense that he used to constantly speak about, with some admiration, uh, about some uh, very great authors. The authors I remember are, they were authors in uh, comparative religion. And he was talking about Heinrich Zimmer and uh, Zainer, I remember. And he, he used to say how original they are, how interesting their viewpoint is, as opposed to a traditional Sanskrit scholar who would be very narrow in his outlook. That's what it meant. So the word original and the word research both had entered my, if I might say so, psyche without proper understanding of these words. So I had wanted always to do original work. As an undergraduate, my great ambition was to do original work in my BTEC project. And I did do it, but originality does not translate always into goodness. So that's something that I came to know a bit later. So that's more or less uh, about my childhood and the way it shaped me. I think it is because of all this that the fourth and fifth year were spent in this particular way of making sense of the world, doing it carefully, you know, perhaps reducing things to logical uh, elements and things of that kind. All those desires probably came from my childhood upbringing. And it has helped me because I continued in this line and I'm, I've been very happy with my professional life. Um, whether as a teacher or as a research worker, I have always enjoyed myself. Sir, you referred to your self-study during your fourth and fifth year, uh, during your BTEC days. Uh, could you talk a little more about it, sir, and tell us how you came to read or Sheshu and read and how you got motivated by that book in order to explore? Yeah, yeah. as I mentioned, uh, I had difficulty in understanding electrical engineering. And the first uh, subject which gave me trouble, because it was the first one of the first subjects which we are taught in uh, third year was electrical circuit theory. So that's where I had all difficulties. You see, it was not a difficult course in the sense that uh, pro exam problem, things like that, they were not difficult. Of course, you could make numerical errors. That kind of thing is always possible. But there were no difficulties where tricky problems were given. It was not of that kind. Because our teacher, Professor Bedford, was a brilliant teacher. And he believed that the exam papers should not be very hard. So the papers were fairly routine. So the difficulties were not of that kind. But as I said, I felt that the stuff is slippery and I would have been happy if I had been able to define things properly and derive things. Now I know that all of this can be done and in fact even in my, after I read uh, Seshu and Reed's book, I knew how to do it. Uh, my BTEC project also had a little bit of it, I remember, on generalized circuit theory or something of that kind where I had written down axioms and proceeded. And I remember that I had no serious difficulty in doing it because of this reading of abstract algebra and the reading of graph theory. I should say one more book I uh, partially read in those days was Claude Bird's graph theory. It was one of the classics in graph theory, one of the first books in graph theory, maybe the first book in graph theory, except for Quinish's book. Quinish's book in German came in 1930s, I think. And Burge's book was published perhaps in 1950s. It's a very influential book. I read parts of it. So the main thing is this. Uh, Session and read does things very rigorously. 
it for instance also introduced a little bit of metroid theory and i had begun reading a bit of metroid theory by then uh, it, that also helped me in understanding circuits in addition uh, with some uh, poor uh, you know feel for the whole thing i remember that i went uh, i said my subject is network topology so let me understand topology so i went and read books on general topology of course they are not related at all but it didn't hurt me to read those books and then uh, uh, the jacobson's book made a difference i did not gain a lot of intuition in those subjects but this idea of defining things formally proving things carefully that i learned only from the it, i mean i i should say that uh, i don't know that i have still learned it but i improved my uh, um, uh, skill in these things by reading this book in abstract algebra until then maths was largely clever tricks manipulation clever tricks constantly and you just have to remember those tricks here things were different and i was very happy in a sense essentially i used to distrust cleverness in those days i used to think that uh, things should be so straightforward that it doesn't matter whether you are smart or not you should be able to follow by just painfully going through it line by line so these are pictures which i no longer hold uh, i think it's uh, it's not practical but uh, that's the way i was in those days sir you mentioned that your interest in matroid theory got triggered when you read the book sheshu henry like how did your interest in matroid theory develop with time sir uh, what happened was sheshu henry has some very small sections on matroids i use them for uh, axiomatizing parts of circuits i remember see matroid theory uh, has a number of uh, components one of the interest in, in important ideas there is the idea of contraction and restriction these correspond if you the, depending upon the way you look at it uh, to open circuit or short circuit or the other way about and the idea of duality so these are very strong uh, underpinnings of metroid theory and it helped me a lot to understand what is going on in circuit there are a lot of uh, small things in circuits which bother you for instance you will find that there is a duality between uh, what could be called uh, voltage based analysis and current based analysis now there is another stronger duality which corresponds to planar graphs so it's uh, often not very clear that why is it that the planar graph duality is not sufficiently general but the other thing seems general so if you want to understand these things the correct way i think is to formulate in terms of either metroid theory or even more uh, uh, directly pertinent to circuits you could uh, uh, think in terms of complementary orthogonal spaces so very early in my career immediately after my phd i switched over from metroids i mean i was doing metroid theory for another 15 20 years that is another matter but as far as application to circuits is concerned i had formulated what i now call implicit linear algebra it is essentially to derive network theory in a topological way that means you only work with kcl and kvl and what can you do there are a number of ideas in uh, circuit theory which depend only on kcl and kvl one example is uh, de de uh, uh, decomposing a network into multiports this has nothing to do with the devices inside it is entirely a topological idea another idea which i formulated which is what i call as topological transformation of electrical networks now by this i mean that you can actually write the equations of a network in terms of another topology but with some additional constraints so while solving you can make it appear as though you are solving the desired network repeatedly and solving certain additional equations so in order to solve a given network which you whose topology you don't like you can solve another network whose topology you like many times but with some additional massaging and you can get the solution to the original network now this idea i have formulated it is there in my book for instance in great detail incidentally i wrote a book called submodular functions and electrical networks in the late 90s the first half of it is on what i now call implicit linear algebra and what would be called advanced network analysis as as a teacher in many many years in when i was a teacher i was uh, uh, 
offering a course called Advanced Network Analysis. Perhaps about 30 times I've offered it. Uh, the contents are really topological network theory. And uh, if one wants a textbook for it, the first half of my book called Submodular Functions and Electrical Networks contains that information. Sir, I have also taken this course called Advanced Network Analysis that you taught in our final semester, sir. Sir, what are the key challenges and open questions in your areas of research, sir? Uh, see, currently what I'm doing is um, to show that Implicit linear algebra can be used wherever there are two sets of constraints. The constraints of the first kind perhaps might be topological. The characteristic feature there are the constraints are very harsh. Like for instance, the coefficients will be 0, 1. So they are accurate constraints, you might say. The second set of constraints are what could be called device characteristic. Now, device characteristics are never known perfectly. There is always a tolerance. See, when you connect circuits, you, when you say that the set net current at a particular node is zero, you're writing I1 plus I2 plus I3 plus I4 equal to zero. Now, there is no ambiguity about the coefficients there. So these are accurate constraints. So accurate and maybe inaccurate is a harsh word, loose constraints, you can say. So how to handle these things in such a way that you get maximum benefit? So implicit linear algebra will allow you to do it. So that's what I'm trying to show in a number of papers. What I'm doing is uh, some, some of the papers are by myself and some are with co-authors. I am uh, writing out the chapters of this book as papers and I'm submitting them to the archive. There is an archive as you probably know. So you can uh, see some of these papers are available already in archive. They have this title implicit linear algebra and something. One of the papers is a fairly long paper, 100 pages, called Implicit Linear Algebra and its Applications. And it talks about the application of implicit linear algebra to multivariable control, to controllability, observability, and all those things. And in addition, it also talks about how to solve dynamic circuits without needless calculations. Uh, since the standard control theory is often in terms of state variables, to reduce a system to first state variables requires a lot of extra work. So in circuits particularly, I have suggested that you break it up into multiports, a capacity multiport, an inductive multiport, and a static multiport. And you make them interact, and everything that you can do with state variables, you can do here. But you don't lose structure at all. And the first step of actually breaking up into multiport is linear time. Whereas the first step in writing state equation is a very painful one. It's a, almost third power algorithm. So this is the sort of thing. And uh, if anybody is interested, any past, any of my past students is interested, they could Google implicit linear algebra and you will see it uh, uh, referring to this uh, archive paper. Uh, I think there is more than one. The latest paper I have with a co-author is called implicit linear algebra and basic circuit theory. And uh, there, what we have done is to uh, generalize Thevenin-Norton theorem to its what we can think is the proper form. The usual Thevenin-Norton, for instance, uh, reduces the uh, port behavior to, say, the behavior when you short circuit certain ports and open circuit certain ports and so on. The problem with this thing is that when you short and open, the circuit may not have a solution. Your practical circuit may or may not have, but the theoretical circuit may not have. So how does one proceed? So we have given a proper algorithm with some tricks and so on, which will always work. And similarly, we have given a, uh, a general form for uh, um, maximum power transfer theorem, which will work whenever maximum transfer theorem is valid. The current form of maximum power transfer, for instance, I'll tell you, in a multiport, the maximum power transfer theorem in the static case will tell you that if the Thevenin impedance matrix is Z, if you attach Z transpose to it, then you will get the maximum power transfer condition. The question arises, what if the Thevenin equivalent doesn't exist? So you need a formulation in which if that formulation fails, the problem can't be solved. So that is the advantage of properly formulating these things. So much of circuit theory is developed like that. Uh, 
the procedures are all very useful very often useful but they sometimes break down and when they break down you don't know whether the problem can't be done at all or only this particular procedure breaks down so it has to be done more carefully and the root i feel is implicit in algebra so you should not think in terms of uniqueness existence of solution but rather in terms of entire subspaces and port's behavior is a very good way of thinking so that is great to hear we'll come back to matroid theory and implicit linear algebra in the later part of our discussion sir what have been the key influences on you at different stages of life uh as i told you in school i think the primary influence was my father's by the way i had a very pleasant childhood ours was a joint family and children were treated with great affection and so on so i mean that was all nice it was uh, so we had a very secure kind of uh, bringing up not too much of discipline so except maybe a little bit from my grandmother's side which we ignored but otherwise uh, we had a very pleasant time so we grew up very secure thinking that whatever we do the parents will support or the elders will support but as far as the intellectual element is concerned i think it was my father's influence which was the dominant one uh later i encountered very interesting people in the department one of the persons who impressed me very early in life was professor bedford who later became my uh, co advisor for my phd uh, he was a brilliant teacher uh, his understanding was extremely good and we all admired him it was not just me the entire class had a very high opinion of him so he was an important influence professor shankar professor murthy and the like Professor Shankar taught us many courses, so he was another very uh, important influence. And the reason, uh, apart from his uh, direct uh, teaching and so on, was that he introduced me to this book, Sesho and Reed, and so on. And I, because of him, I read it very carefully and understood it well, and so on. I remember that he had asked me, "You solve all the problems and give me the solutions." So I had given him. <laughs> so I don't know what he did. Probably must have lost it immediately or something. Uh, and uh, in addition i encountered professor vartak in my final year he has been another very important influence he was my guide for my phd i went to uh, for my btech project uh, examination i wanted some expert so i requested professor vartak also to be present so he was there and i remember that he uh, supported me very well and gave me confidence and so on then after that uh, during my phd days professor vartak was a very important influence later i encountered to some extent i must say that very early in my uh, um, uh, phd program i encountered the work of the japanese community optimization people and they influenced me quite a lot and the, among them the most important is professor iri i'll talk a little bit more about him as i go along i'll tell you how the phd proceeded uh, see in my first year of phd that is in 1969 or so when i joined the program i went to the math department incidentally uh, although i was a joint student between maths and physics, maths and electrical engineering because i didn't want to lose the tag of electrical engineering so in uh, what i did was to look up uh, this IEEE transaction circuit theory. There were a few papers which impressed me immediately, and one was a paper by Kishi and Kajitani. It was called the principal partition of a graph, uh, and I found it very interesting, and I found uh, it uh, slippery also, and I thought it meant more than now I know what it means. Uh, one of the things that interested me was they were breaking up a graph into three pieces. and they showed that by breaking up into three pieces you can choose your variables in such a way that some voltages from one part some currents from another part if you choose then you will get a minimum number of variables in terms of which a circuit can be solved this they did not show but it is evident from their uh, uh, results that such a thing can be done some other group actually solved uh, three groups actually worked on these ideas one is kishi and kajitani who actually proposed the thing and the other was another group 
of whom I don't remember too many names. One of them was Otsuki. And the other group had Professor Eri. Now, Professor Eri I had encountered even earlier. Uh, he was doing extremely hard work. By hard work, I mean, I mean not hard for him, but for the reader. And uh, one of the uh, one of the papers which I used to find hard, the books and papers, was by Gabriel Krohn on dioptics, network analysis by tearing. And the Japanese group had taken up his work and extended it further. That much I remember. And Krohn I could never follow very well and I was therefore impressed with them. I couldn't follow them either. Later I realized that what one has to do when you don't follow is to isolate things find out what is difficult and what is not so difficult and concentrate on the not so difficult one. That's what I did. So one way of looking at implicit linear algebra is to say that you're doing Crohn's dioptics, but without the devices. That's the way one can think about it. So let me go back. Professor Eri, uh, I encountered because in my PhD days, I had encountered his name. I had tried to read his papers. Uh, the principal partition idea, uh, the things that were interesting to me in those days were that you were breaking up the graph into three pieces, each of which is invariant under the automorphisms of the graph. I was interested in this for the reason that I was also looking at the isomorphism problem in those graphs. That was one of the important open problems in those days. And I thought that if you can break up a graph into pieces which are invariant under automorphisms, maybe you can look at those pieces and study their isomorphisms with other graphs and so on. So one of the things that you have to do in this is that you must, whatever is the method of breaking, have you done the finest possible partition? That's the question. So in principle partition, Kishi and Kajitani had broken it up into three pieces. So the question arises, are these pieces the smallest possible in some sense? They aren't actually. It turns out that the middle part, there are three pieces. The middle part is distinctly different from the other two, which are duals of each other. So after some time, I could uh, uh, solve this problem of find, finding the smallest pieces. And that is called the principal partition of metroids. Independently of me, Tomizawa of University of Tokyo was also working on this problem. And after my PhD, I had written to Professor Vartak, sending him my thesis, or at least the part that had metroids, that even the metroid part was quite long, some almost 300 pages, I think. And he had responded very favorably immediately. And he had also mentioned that uh, we have done the same work independently and so on. But he gave me credit for it. And when I went to a conference in 1979 to Tokyo, he actually announced uh, in public in the in a session that I had also done the principal partition work independently. So that gave me some standing in this group. So Professor Eri after that also uh, kept in touch with me until his retirement, maybe 92 or something like that. He was at the University of Tokyo and uh, gave me advice on the kind of research that I might like to do. Uh, I may not have followed his advice very strictly, but they always influence me. And I remember that he recommended that I don't look at dioptics too very seriously. In a sense, what I have done is a kind of dioptics, but the implicit lineage that I'm talking about, but he did not have the elements of devices. So therefore I could claim that I have followed his advice. So Professor Iri has, has been a very important influence. In uh, 1983, I went to uh, UC Berkeley. I was in the EECS department. And there I encountered some very good people, Professor Varea, Professor Desover. <clears throat> These people were very kind and helpful. And in addition, Professor Lawler in the CS department, he was uh, very uh, kind and he invited me to give some guest lectures in his course and things like that. He was always friendly. Then, um, yeah, another per very interesting person that I came across, I should mention is that in my first year of PhD, 1969, after reading Kishi and Kajitani's paper, 
by the way, Kishian Kajita in his paper is principal partition of a graph. You can immediately see that principal partition of a graph is really principal partition of a metroid. And what they do is a kind of imperfect principal partition of a metroid. And uh, as I said, they can be broken up even further. And after you break it up fully, that is called the principal partition of a metroid. Now, uh, that paper I wrote was called uh, Metroidal Invariance for Graphs. And I submitted it to JCT. So after about three, four, God knows how many years, maybe four years, uh, there was a reply from the editor saying that the paper is rejected. However, the uh, reviewer uh, has chosen to reveal himself and he has uh, something to say. And he, the reviewer had written a five page uh, review in which he really had educated me on all the things that were going on. The reviewer was Professor J. Edmonds, Jack Edmonds, a very famous name in computer optimization. And it's really unheard of that a reviewer reveals his name and tries to educate a person and so on. So Professor Edmonds is of that kind. So when I look back, these people who have been kind, Professor Vartak was kind, Professor Bedford was kind, and people like Erie and uh, Jack Edmonds, I mean, I don't understand. Why is it that some outsider comes and they still are so nice and kind to that person? So it really impresses me. And I feel that there is something deep going on that it's perhaps a fundamental principle in life that one should be kind. Uh, and I, to some extent, they have influenced me, I should say. Jack Edmonds is, uh, later I did encounter him in some conferences and so on. And I mentioned... Uh, how he rejected my paper. So he got annoyed with me initially saying, I never rejected your paper, what do you mean? And so on. And then I explained to him, he said, yeah, now I remember a little bit about it. And he became extremely friendly after that. So during uh, some four conferences, those conferences are every four years or three years, I don't remember, but I attended about four of them. And every time I met him. And when my book was published, Submodular Functions, and by the way, Submodular Functions was formulated, he's the founder of the subject. Jack Edmund is the founder. And when this book was published, uh, it was, I think, displayed in the conference or something like that. And he went and bought it. He came and said, hey, I bought your book. The next day he comes and tells me that yesterday I took it to a banquet and lost it. So, <laughs> so I'd, but in spite of that, in the next time when I met him in the conference, he introduced me to people saying that he has done uh, formal work in submodular function and things like that. And, generally spoke favorably of me and I felt very happy. Uh, so Jack Edmonds has been a, an important influence during the period maybe 94 to 2002 or so, after which uh, we lost touch. But he's a very impressive person, really. Uh, quite a person who doesn't go with the stream. And um, Generally, his views uh, would not be the standard conservative views. He's a typical outsider. But a man who has really done very deep work and the subject polyhedral combinatorics is due to him. So he's another person who has influenced me. By the way, I use these words like influence as though I have done anything. But these people have shaped my thinking, however defective it might be. So I don't want to appear very pompous. But they have been good influences. One more person, let me mention. He was yes. also very peculiar, actually. Yes. Professor A. W. Ingleton of Oxford. Yes. And uh, maybe Professor Welsh, who has written a book on Metroids. I used to correspond with them. Right. Uh, more with Ingleton than with Welsh. And I remember that I used to write, you know, this was days before email or anything like that. So I had to write aerograms. Correct. Right. You know. So the thing was written and uh, he would respond by aerogram. Right. I mean, some outsider writes and I would ask him questions about touch papers and so on. He would respond. And I even remember that once he thought my question was trivial and he dismissed it. And for that also he had written a reply. And then I wrote back saying this is what I mean. And then he wrote that, you know, he corrected it and uh, wrote in great detail and so on. Very brilliant chap actually. Uh, uh, and uh, I, once again, I'm very impressed with these people that they have some special rule that they should respond when somebody is serious and so on. 
should respond. I don't know whether these rules will still hold with uh, people being barraged by emails in tens and thousands. But in those days, you know, you could write a mail, a snail mail, and get some response, maybe after two months, but you still get it. So that was an interesting thing. Professor A.W. Ingleton, uh, when I retired, I wrote to Professor uh, Welsh. He wrote back immediately, and he did remember me also. And I asked him, how is Professor Ingleton? And he had passed away many years before, some illness, I think. And he had uh, written a little bit about the kind of person he was and so on. So, yeah, I mean, a greatly admired person, very brilliant man. He was another man who actually, these are all people who tell you that, you know, when we are academics, we have a larger role. That anybody who writes, you have to write back kindly. <laughs> So it's not, you know, when when the mail is something that is sent out uh, uh, some scattergun or something of that kind, then it is a different matter. But uh, when a personal mail comes to you, you are supposed to respond. So this is a picture that I have. It may not be possible for all professionals, I think, but I don't regard myself as a professional, so it's okay. Sir, are you still in communication with Professor Masao Iri of the University of Tokyo? No, uh, the last time I corresponded with him was in 2005. Even then, he would have been, uh, maybe he would have been around 80 or something. So, he, so, but he also wrote back immediately and wrote, uh, you know, very enthusiastically, uh, very happy that he, I was visiting Professor Fujishige in those days uh, in Kyoto. Kyoto has a maths institute called Research Institute in Mathematical Sciences. Something like our TAFR, in, in the Japanese equivalent of TAFR. But there are separate institutes for physics, maths, and so on. So I spent about a month with him at that time. And I wrote to all these people. And Professor Yiri wrote back very nicely, I remember. I was thinking of going and visiting him. But uh, I was uh, kind of embarrassed and feeling that maybe I'll be kind of troubling him. So I didn't do it finally. Sir, your teaching has had a huge impact on me and my classmates. In fact, a year after I graduated, I had a dream where you appeared and was actually teaching me about complementary orthogonal vector spaces, about how KCL and KVL vector spaces are complementary orthogonal to each other. So this actually shows the kind of impact your lectures have had on me. Sir, how do you recollect, you know, your teaching over the years at IIT? Yeah, let me see. See, uh, our generation grew up very differently. And I told, as I told you, we went to a school where children were supposed to be <laughs> seen and not heard. So we didn't have too many opportunities to express ourselves. By the way, I'm not complaining about my school. I think it was all right. My teachers were very, very good. And I mentioned that some of them were excellent, actually. But the point is that we were not allowed a lot of freedom to express ourselves. So facing a class and so on does not come or did not come to me very easily. In 1974, when I began teaching, the first course that I taught was uh, some 20 lectures on Metroid theory for colleagues. Professor Bedford and others attended. The next was a course on principles of electrical engineering for metallurgical engine department, if I remember rightly. And I remember preparing enormously hard for those lectures. Write down the whole thing, then uh, prepare summary, then prepare questions and answers, you know, possible questions that the student may, things of that kind. So this continued for a few years. And uh, somehow, after some time, suddenly the, the desire to impress people went away. I don't know how it happens. Uh, I think it happened after I returned from UC Berkeley. And after that, I have really not been, unless the subject is a new subject, I don't prepare specifically for that lecture. I let the thing evolve as I go, go along in the class. I mean, I don't do this in courses with which I am not familiar. But the major thing is this, the desire to impress people had dropped out. Now, once that drops out, you're a bit more secure. If you make, you're not afraid of making a fool of yourself in the class. You have to sort of convince yourself that the students are your friends. They are not really interested in embracing you or something. 
So if you think like that, you are a bit more comfortable and you will find that the students also go along. Generally, so my lectures used to be, I'll ask a question because that question would have been uppermost in my mind at that time. We'll discuss the answer to that question using the students uh, feedback and so on. And somehow the lecture will get done. Now, what happens is a specific lecture may not be directly in line with the course, but overall the material in the course will get covered and covered quite well. So this is the way it used to work in those days. The other thing I must say is in the early part of my career, I was very much interested in how students think about concepts, particularly the quote unquote bright students, because my own ideas, the way they evolved was fairly clear to me at that time. And I was very impressed when I saw very advanced students in the undergraduate curriculum. So I was spending a lot of time with them. And, uh, uh, but gradually it turned out my viewpoint changed a bit. And I started imagining that what about the student who is struggling, things of that kind. I used to worry about the students who is not doing too well what is going wrong for him. And I used to think after some time that every student is important, not only the brightest and the most prepared. So you have to do something about the student who is struggling. In those days, the range of uh, preparedness in the class was not as high as it is now. Now you will find that some guys are two to three years ahead and others are probably two to three years behind the average. Now, that kind of thing was not happening in those days. But even then, there was enough rain and there were people who were struggling. There could be people like me who would be struggling simply because, uh, you know, they found the thing subject not very rigorous. So, different kinds of difficulties could be there. There could be serious students, other students who are put off by something. So, I used to think that every student must get something out of my course. And I used to put in the effort required, if necessary, uh, meet the students outside the class and things like that. And uh, I think it has been a rewarding experience for me if I had concentrated only on my uh, research, only on dealing with uh, smart students and so on. I don't think I would have had as pleasant a time. Now I look back and I look back with some fondness uh, with of, for all those students whom I hope I helped a little bit. So that is really great to hear. One of my recollections of my third and fourth year is that I used to come to your room without really making an appointment and we would have discussions on various uh, topics. A lot of those discussions were completely impromptu. So I would say that you were very, very open and approachable to me and my classmates. Sir. And that is something that we really enjoyed a lot as students. Yeah, I think I also enjoyed it. Uh, that's one reason why I would have encouraged people to come and meet me. Uh, see, I used to work on problems all the time. In fact, back, back of my mind, something or other will be going on. But I had reasonable amount of free time for students. And it increased in the uh, period 2005 to my retirement 2018 uh, during that time i moved out of the campus and uh, so i used to bring my tiffin home my tiffin to the department uh, and uh, therefore i had plenty of time during lunch time so i used to tell students that between 12 30 and 2 30 i'm available if you want to discuss anything at all you can come you must give me a few minutes for eating so during that time you can be there i don't mind so that's the way it used to be. And invariably, somebody or other will come. And we used to chat and so on. And I think I enjoyed it quite a bit. And I came to know a lot about how students think and how life is difficult for some of them and so on. So these things you actually encounter when people talk to you. And that's what happened to me. And I do look back on those things with some satisfaction. And we are, uh, Professor Bishwas and I ran a special program for students who come ill prepared to the institute for two years, nine, 2011 and 2012, I think we ran. And these were students uh, who were extremely weak to come in and they, are, they were also weak in English. So what we did was we kind of isolated them as far as the theory is concerned in the first semester. 
So they were low JEE rank holders. Uh, not all of them, some of them actually volunteered, but they were given 14 to 15 hours of instruction per week in English by professionals. Professor Bishwas and I taught them, I think Professor Bishwas must have taught them uh, probably the first course in programming. I taught them physics and maths, uh, the first year maths and first year physics, maybe electromagnetic fields or something of that kind. And uh, we spent a lot of time with them. The number of hours spent was more than they would have had in the courses. And in addition, there were only about 30 or 40. And they all got personal attention. And they were not being compared with students who were doing extremely well. This did seem to benefit them. This idea of isolating students from others who are very competitive, who do well in exams and so on. Suppose a group of students is not doing well in exams. It's very demoralizing for them to see another group who are in the same class who don't prepare at all and score very well. So actually they get put off from studies. Now that I think we could get around for these students. Many of these students did well. In fact, if I remember rightly, one of them had a nine, was a nine pointer later. Nine out of 10 CGPA. So I think it did make some difference, but unfortunately the institute could not, we, we did it as volunteers. We couldn't uh, um, convince the departments to take over something like that. Uh, I think it's an effective method and uh, probably the institute will benefit if some such program is there even now. See, earlier there was something called a preparatory program, which was meant for students who could not get into JEE, uh, but who were just uh, at the borderline of getting in. So they were given a one-year training and then allowed to come into the institute. That preparatory program was very effective. And I, in my opinion, it was very effective because of this isolation factor, that you're isolating students who are not so well prepared from others who are very well prepared. So because of that, they get some time to develop and they gain confidence. And many of them have done well. In fact, I know of some preparatory students who went through preparatory. Some of them have done PhD in our department, by the way, and they were outstanding students. And I know some who were also very competitive. One of them got a silver medal in some department I remember. So this can happen. And we must remember that these are young people. And this is actually a human problem, not just a young man's problem. That if you are constantly with people who appear much better than you, you do lose confidence. So I think one must uh, take care of these things. Then the students will benefit far more and will, be, will shine much more, I think will appreciate their subjects, will like their subjects, and so on. <clears throat> so that is very nice to hear, sir, that uh, yourself and Professor Biswa spent so much of time with the students and uh, brought them to speed. So this is uh, really great to hear. Sir, the batch of 1981 has shared a very interesting anecdote with me about you and the Rubik's Cube, sir. So I believe in the late 70s, when the Rubik's Cube was just introduced, you actually developed algorithm to actually solve the Rubik's Cube. In, I think something like half a day or something like that. Could you actually tell us more about that incident, sir? Yeah, I, uh, like many people, I was also fascinated with the Rubik's Cube. First of all, one couldn't imagine how something could rotate in every direction possible. Uh, so uh, I had uh, thought about it. I had not seen a Rubik's Cube. And then I worked out an algorithm for uh, making all the colors correct and so on. And that uh, I was telling people, I, I had never had the habit of keeping things to myself. I should have kept quiet. But I told my friends, I know how to solve. But I had not seen the Rubik's Cube. So one of my friends, Professor Jagdish, brought the Rubik's Cube to my room and said, now you solve it. When I solved it, only one phase came out right. So I requested him uh, uh, to give it to me for a day and I tried. And I do remember that I worked out uh, some moves, used some finite group ideas. Generally, the idea is something like this. After some, you know, you, you are in a particular state. It is not a complete uh, description of the cube, but a portion of it. And that state you can repeat after a certain number of moves. During those moves, you can do something else. 
because at the end of those uh, sequence of moves you will come back to this state you could have done something by which you have improved the state in some other direction now this is the sort of thing that i was doing and i wrote out the steps for the uh, state in which the cube was and then finally i you solved the whole thing by looking at my paper and every every time calculating what is the next move i should do and so on and finally managed to get a solution by middle of the night i think around 12 o'clock or so i managed to get it took about an hour and i was actually not very good with directly uh, moving the cube in my hands so i had to every time look at the algorithm in the paper and then come and do something in the cube so finally managed but took about an hour So that's the way it worked. I didn't write it up. I had notes for myself, I think, but I don't think I wrote and sent. I, it, if I had sent, it wouldn't have got published, because by then people were writing quite a bit on Rubik's cube. Sir, could you please tell our viewers more about your book, Submodular Functions and Electrical Networks? Yeah. So the book was really uh, uh, had its origin from my uh, work since my PhD. Uh, what happened was, uh, as I said, uh, I had my thesis was on theory of metroids and network analysis, and immediately after uh, submission, when I joined the department, I have a feeling I had a feeling of dissatisfaction with metroids that one is not getting enough mileage by applying metroids to circuits. So I formulated a different way of attacking circuits, and that was to work only with KCL and KVL. Which, which is what I now call implicit linear algebra. So my course, uh, advanced network analysis, was based on these ideas, and I taught it from 1977 to 1982. That is six years, and then again from your batch, which is perhaps eight, 92 or so. I don't know. From uh, yes, 92 sir, to 92. 92 to 2016. Except for a break, ninety-five when I took a sabbatical, I ran this course. So the work that I did from uh, the late seventies to eighties is contained in this book. The first half of it is really advanced network analysis. You could call it implicit linear algebra now, and the second half of it is on submodular function. Now that came out in a fairly interesting way. Uh, I was very suspicious of submodular functions in the beginning. The reason is submodular functions is a generalization of metroids. Now, it's a submod, it's a generalization of the idea of rank function of a metroid. Now, metroids itself is a generalization of graphs. So, what I felt was that uh, metroids yes. is not giving enough mileage for the effort you put in as far as circuits is concerned. which is why i started moving towards kcl and kvl <clears throat> and initially i was very suspicious of some modular function but then in uh, late 80s i solved a problem in the so called hybrid rank problem a generalization of hybrid rank which uh, could be regarded as a generalization of the original topological degree of freedom problem the topological degree of freedom problem as i probably mentioned is uh, what is the least number of voltage and current variables in terms of which the entire circuit can be solved by that is meant you have a set of voltages and a set of currents from these voltages and current using kcl and kvl alone you must be able to get every voltage or current of every branch either voltage or current of every branch the uh, remaining variables you can use ohm's law to get so that's the idea and what is the minimum number now if you go in that direction first thing you get is uh the principal partition now i was after some time thinking somewhat differently what if there are groups of uh, devices and uh, which can be treated as multiports now multiports can be viewed if you have a let's say three ports you can view them as uh, different kinds of port structures for instance one could be a path with three edges the other could be a star kind of tree now all of these are valid as far as studying the multipole is concerned so the question that arose for me was what if i the my circuit is made up of such multipoles and i am allowed to transform every multipole into an equivalent multipole by port transformation in that case what is the least number of variables 
I managed to solve it. It was actually very hard for me. I managed to solve it in the late 80s. And that for solving it, I needed submodular function. And not only did I need submodular function, I actually had to develop some submodular function theory to solve it. So this really impressed me because I was suspicious of submodular functions, as I told you before. And I started feeling that submodular function is the right level of generalization for many, many problems. So the work that I did I, uh, is the second half of my book, Submodular Functions in Electrical Network. The book is around 600 and something, 300 pages around submodular function. And it has some material which is not even now easily available outside, particularly on the idea of what is called Dilbert truncation of submodular function. It doesn't have, uh, other books don't have that material as much as this. In addition, uh, some of the work that I did for my PhD, I translated into submodular function and put it there. They are also not available elsewhere so easily. But a book is written like a, a textbook with lots of solved examples. Uh, and the idea is really to uh, make it useful for self-study. So that book uh, I wrote in 95. I took a sabbatical and wrote it. I wrote it like a journalist, uh, something like 10 pages every day, 10 full scap sheets every day. So that's where I wrote it. And the next year, edited it. I got a very good typist, by the way. And uh, fortunately, it got through in a good series and so on. It was actually, uh, in a sense, uh, recommended by some very good people for the series. So the series is a good one, Annals of Discrete Mathematics. And in 2009, I revised it. I requested Elsevier, who were the owners at that time, uh, for, for uh, bringing out a cheap edition in India. So when I suggested about five or 600 rupees, they were sort of reluctant. Then I said, why don't you give me a copyright waiver? So they gave a copyright waiver. So I have revised the book. By that, I mean, I have corrected the errors to the extent possible. And I put it out on my web page. So that's where it is now. The original copy is uh, very expensive. And this is free. Anybody can take it. And I do see that it gets downloaded quite often. So many times during our discussion today, you've been referring to implicit linear algebra. So could you please tell our viewers more about implicit linear algebra, sir? OK. Uh, so implicit linear algebra is, uh, is something that is uh, very directly uh, evidenced, or um, you get a direct example of it in circuits. In circuits, what happens is you may have interest in the input-output variables. But the input-output variables are not available as they are, if you look at all the constraints. But there are a lot of internal variables. So how does one talk about, or do we, for instance, one way of thinking about it is that you eliminate the other variables. OK, in a very general sense, one can eliminate. But if you do such things, the structural information that you have in terms of graphs and so on will get completely disturbed. And you can't utilize it well. So what? One does an implicit linear algebra is to leave the variables in place as they are. So for instance, you may have equations of this kind, a1, x1 plus a2, x2 equal to 0. a2 hat or a2 dash x2 is also equal to 0. Suppose you have a set of constraints like this. And the variable in which you are interested in is x1. By the way, you must think of x1, x2, and so on as vectors. So the variable you are interested in is in x1. Now, one way of doing it is that you can eliminate the variable x2 in a very general way, and you will get a new set of constraints. But in the process, you would have completely destroyed the structure of the original set of constraints. For instance, invariably, the a1 x1 plus a2 x2 equal to 0 would be of a kind which is really based on graphs or something of that kind. So the graph structure you will destroy when you go and do something like elimination. For instance, a2 dash x2 you can think of as device characteristic, the internal constraints using the devices. So it would be better if we can somehow deal with the variables as they are. So implicit linear algebra permits you to do that. There are only two basic results there. One is called the implicit inversion theorem, and the other is called the implicit duality theorem. The implicit inversion theorem is a generalization of ax equal to b when does it have a unique solution? When does the solution exist? 
uh, you probably know that uh, ax equal to b will have a unique solution if the columns are linearly independent if the solutions exist and if a has linearly independent rows then it will always have a solution so this is the general condition now this extends in this implicit frame way in a particular way and it is very useful to handle it in that way the characteristic feature in implicit linear algebra is you don't deal by and large with vectors at all you deal with subspaces you manipulate subspaces and the important operation is something which i have called uh, uh, matched composition i have called it uh, so that corresponds to something like this if you put two multiports together they uh, the common variables at the ports match in terms of voltages becoming equal to each other and currents being negatives of each other now this kind of matching is what i called as match composition it turns out to be a generalization of the usual uh, function composition and it has its own properties and you still can deal with it point is this the ordinary linear algebra is based on linear transformations very often linear transformations are not natural to the subject in circuits the linear transformation is not natural because multiports when you connect them together it is not as though you are mapping something onto something else and so on you are only connecting them so the fundamental ideas are linear relations the two theorems are one is implicit inversion theorem and the second is implicit duality theorem which i would say is even more powerful because we can see its applications all over the place the implicit duality theorem says something like this it's a generalization of the idea if you have matrices a b a b transpose is b transpose a transpose it's a generalization of that idea it actually has to be stated in terms of orthogonality so suppose you have uh, this set of equations a1 x1 plus a2 x2 equal to 0 and a2 dash x2 equal to 0 the vector x1 will now belong to a particular space after elimination of variables i want to build the complementary orthogonal space to that this is a very common situation so one way is eliminate everything get uh, explicit expression for the uh, uh, vector space in terms of its basis and then build a complementary orthogonal space but in the process all structure would have got damaged instead what the theorem says is you take the a1 x1 plus a2 x2 equal to 0 you take that complementary orthogonalize that then you take the a2 x2 equal to 0 complementary orthogonalize that that means you now have variables y1 y2 and you have b1 y1 plus b2 y2 equal to 0 and b2 dash y2 equal to 0 you have such equation if you eliminate the variables there then you will see that the y1 and x1 variables are complementary orthogonal so this is a very powerful idea which you can use very often in circuits in fact in circuits it was kind of known but uh, unfortunately the proofs are lacking and it, you can't even make out from the literature that the authors are aware that the proofs are lacking for instance in complementary orthogonality if you have two vector spaces you have to show two things a vector here is perpendicular to any vector in the other space in the second case you have to say that if a vector is perpendicular to every vector in the first vector space then it belongs to the second often the easier thing is to show only the first part and then you will find in the literature invariably this is taken as complementary orthogonal it's completely wrong and because of this you can say now implicit duality theorem was known for long but with this wrong proof you can carry on it turns out that the implicit duality theorem can be proved quickly and there are many proofs i have given about five proofs in the book i have got more proofs later and every one of these gaps in the reasoning that you see in circuits you can fill by using implicit duality theorem and usually using two or three lines so it's a very powerful result and in fact uh, one of the aims that i had originally was to write out a series of papers called implicit duality theorem and its application now it has become implicit linear algebra and its application and uh, if people want to look at it in my archive there is a paper called implicit linear algebra and its applications so about 100 pages and it gives a reasonably good overview i will continue publishing uh, more applications and finally i will put them together as a book in the same form as my previous book with lots of solved examples figures and solutions and the like 
Sir, for the benefit of our viewers, could you also briefly talk about Metroid theory? Yeah. So Metroids were originally invented by a very famous mathematician when he was a young man called Hassler Whitney. He is uh, one of the most famous American mathematicians of the last century. He worked on graph theory for his PhD. He worked with uh, a mathematician called George David Birkhoff. His son is also very famous as a co-author of an important book in algebra called Garrett Birkhoff. But George David Birkhoff was interested in graph theory and he was specifically interested in the open, uh, the four color problem. Four color problem is on a planar graph, uh, how many colors do you require for coloring countries in such a way that uh, neighboring countries have different colors? Four is sufficient is the conjecture. It was solved only in 1976 with heavy use of computers and so on. But many people were trying it. Many great mathematicians tried it. Birkhoff tried it. And uh, so did Hassler Whitney. So his uh, sequence of papers which he wrote during his PhD days are available. Uh, at least their summaries are available in Seishu and Read. One can look at it. Of course, the papers are also available. They are very readable. Uh, and they are, his work is very relevant to circuit theory directly relevant. It is of the kind that is available in uh, Seishu and Reed. So after he did all this, he summarized his ideas about all these things in a paper called the on the abstract properties of linear independence that appeared in 1935. Now, that was the last paper that he this gentleman wrote in optim in uh, combinatorics. He moved away to algebraic topology and he has done very profound work. Uh, other people have told me about it and so on. He's a very impressive figure. Uh, the subject was sort of sleeping for some time. In the late 40s, W.T. Tut took up, a, I think, took it up perhaps for his PhD. And he started working on a very difficult problem. Namely, under what conditions can a Metroid be represented by means of a graph? Now, this problem he managed to solve in 1958, I think or at least the paper appeared in 1958. And uh, he has uh, given a series of lectures called Lectures on Metroids in 1965, uh, NBS Journal of Mathematics. So those were the lectures which I read when I was doing uh, PhD because no other material was available. I think something else was also done. Some interesting work was done by Richard Rado, maybe in the early 40s, where he combined metroids with bipartite matching. That's an important result. But other, the most important result until then was uh, definitely Tuts. Now, in uh, 1965, uh, Edmonds uh, moved into metroids and he did some truly profound work. He also generalized it to submodular functions and handled submodular functions in a very general way. He introduced the subject of polyhedral combinatorics. He actually formulated the idea of polynomial time complexity. He did all that. He called those algorithms good algorithms. He gave the first good algorithm for the, um, for the general graph matching problem. What is the general graph matching problem? You have to find the maximum set of edges in the graph which do not have common nodes. That's called a matching and you have to find the maximum size. Now Edmonds gave an algorithm which was polynomial time. It was a truly a breakthrough and the paper was called Paths, Trees and Flowers. It appeared in Canadian Journal of Mathematics. Edmonds was a man, man with some literary ambitions, I think. So his titles are of that kind. He is probably the man who formulated the idea of a greedy algorithm. So, so uh, among other things, uh, Edmonds uh, uh, discovered a theorem called the Metroid Intersection Theorem, the Metroid Union Theorem. Now, I remember that Lawler wrote a very influential book uh, showing that Metroid intersection has uh, consequences in computer science. Uh, that was a starting point for uh, many computer scientists to get interested in Metroid theory. Now, it is a very thriving area in computer science. It is also a thriving area in pure mathematics. So, there are actually specialists who work only in Metroids. That's going on. Whereas in networks itself, somehow it has not caught on. 
I, maybe by by the time I wrote my thesis, my thesis was called Theory of Metroids and Network Analysis. Perhaps uh, less than half a dozen such theses would have been written in, uh, uh, you know, applying metroids to circuits. So in electrical engineering, the uh, metroid has not been sufficiently influential. The Japanese school has done a lot. They have actually given, uh, uh, formulated many applications of principal partition. That's an important thing. And if you can do something with principal partition, so can you with principal lattice of partition which is an idea that I formulated for solving the hybrid rank problem. So these are ideas which can be used and by and large, the applications are towards nowadays, for instance, submodular function is a very important area in machine learning. So, so in machine learning, principal partition will play a role. So will principal lattice of partition. So I have been told by some experts. Metroids, as I said, is thriving uh, both in pure mathematics as well as in uh, computer science. Not so much in electrical engineering, although there will be a few people, but it has not taken on in a big way. So the third that you mentioned is also well known for his contributions to extremal graph theory. Yeah, mm. he is uh, probably the most important graph theorist of the last century. Very mm. important figure. And I must mention that Tut did uh, uh, very valuable work in decoding secret messages during the Second World War. He, in fact, did uh, far uh, more impactful work than Turing. Turing's work is very famous. And nobody knew about Tut's work. What happened was, somehow or other, they got uh, classified as secret. And there is a certain period during which the files do not come out. And I think in the late uh, 90s or so, they were revealed. and. Uh, Tut was very happy because he became a hero. <laughs> He's one of the great heroes of Second World War, I think. He contributed towards the Allies' victory. So one consistent theme in our discussion today, apart from Matroids, implicit linear algebra and submodular functions, is about the importance of kindness. So could you talk a little more about kindness? Because that seems to be a very important thing that is coming out in today's discussion. Yeah, I feel that as teachers, we have to be kind. I suppose uh, as human beings, you have to be kind. But as teachers, it is very important to be kind. It is, see, the, it, it's very, if I have heard students, for instance, talking like this. So-and-so is a brilliant lecturer. And then you ask him afterwards, OK, what was the subject he taught? Oh, we didn't follow it too well. He was a brilliant lecturer. Now, I think this is a completely wrong picture of what is teaching. Teaching is about making the student interested, making him love the subject. So you have to put in some effort. I mean, you will not always succeed because the student might have other problems and might be distracted because of other reasons and so on. But you have to put in the effort. And particularly, you must locate students who are struggling, isolate them separately and deal with them. And in places like IIT, it is possible. And let me tell you that even now, I find that there are some, some of my younger colleagues who don't just give up, they keep fighting for uh, uh, students who are struggling. They do something extra. They don't probably spend the uh, same time as we could in those days, but they would take extra classes that they do definitely do. So there is that element even now. So my feeling was that after about uh, six or seven years, of admiring uh, bright undergraduates, I switched over to this side. And I found that uh, if a student uh, lights up, his face lights up for some reason, that gives you pleasure for that day. I had so also had some, accidentally I've had some very interesting experiences. In 1985, I came back from Berkeley and I got involved with a student. I won't mention the department and so on. It was not our department. He was about to be sent out. And for some reason or other, they said you can mentor him for a year. So all I did was to insist that he meets me every day, tells me that he has not missed any class. This chap was a very interesting chap. Uh, until then, his plan was something like this. He'll sleep during the day. During the evening, miss all classes. During the evening, he'll go hunt for partners for bridge and play <laughs> bridge overnight. He's supposed to be a good player. And this is what he was doing. So naturally, the courses were not going well. 
So I used to insist that you come and tell me the moment you have missed a class, you must come and tell me what has happened and so on. Now, within two, three months, things changed. Uh, and at the end of the year, he appears for gate and he stood fourth in the country. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and then he is, took up a PhD. I don't want to mention more than that because he might be listening. So I'll keep quiet. <laughs> but it was an accident. But at the same time, what he needed was a bit of a nudge and somebody seeing to it that he doesn't deviate. <laughs> so that's all. I didn't do any counseling, by the way. Later, of course, I was doing serious counseling. But counseling, you know, is not always helpful. You can try, but you should try. It's not always helpful, but routines are very important. If you can somehow force the student to follow some minimum routine, for instance, you should not miss classes. So why does the student miss class? Because he has initially done something wrong and then you find the subject difficult. So it is painful to sit in the class. So he doesn't go at all. So this uh, vicious cycle you have to break. So I used to try it with students and it used to work to some extent. Uh, for instance, uh, after some time when I started handling large number of students, what I used to do was, you bring me your diary. You have to write from 8 in the morning to something like 12 in the night. What did you do every hour? So you'll, they'll bring. And uh, for many, even that, uh, holding on to that routine was sufficient. But of course, in a few cases, the friends of those students will come and tell me, sir, he's just writing up the diary just before he comes to meet you. <laughs> so that, <laughs> So it is like a, going to a temple or something. <laughs> you conduct, you finish the ritual and go back. That also can happen. But anyway, the parts that I, looking back, the part that I like most and the thing that I remember most is when the student responds to kindness. That's what I like most. I don't think I remember the bright students with, uh, you know, as great intensity as these people. Although I do remember because my memory of... Uh, let's say up to 90 or so is very good. After that, the, you know, the usual aging problem, I don't remember what happened yesterday too well. But what happened 30 years ago, I remember very well. For instance, your class, I remember. I could recognize you immediately. I remember that. But I think uh, by late 90s or maybe uh, 2000 onwards, I don't remember that well. So anyway, to summarize, I think kindness is uh, something that we can, you know, we can always yes. be kind. So we should be kind, I think. That's about all that one yes. can do. You know, mostly we are helpless in life. Uh, random events take place and we keep doing things. So at least be kind. That's enough. Yes. So what you just said is a very important life lesson, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, uh, coming to your association with IIT Bombay, uh, this is an association that spans, you'll say, 56 years, you know, from 1964 to today. So what changes have you seen in the institute at a physical level in terms of the campus and infrastructure? And what changes have you seen at an academic level? And what changes have you seen in the students in the last 56 years, as it were? Yeah, I'll tell you. Physically, I'll tell you. I remember... Uh, uh, you know, coming in in June, I think uh, we got into the program, perhaps in June, maybe only for the interview and things like that. But I remember looking at the thing and the place was so nice and so impressive and trees were there, greenery was there and so on. So it was very, we were all very impressed. But you know, if you look at the photographs of those uh, in main building, if you go, there is a picture of uh, the hill or maybe the picture of IIT from the hill or something like that uh, of 1970. There is almost no greenery. <laughs> so what appeared very green to us is very different. So currently IIT is very green. People might criticize felling of trees and this and that and so on. Many of the trees were actually uh, planted uh, after uh, 1970s and so on. In the beginning, the uh, uh, hills are also uh, suffering because when it gets dry, somebody or other will light a match there and burn the whole place. Now that is not happening. So the place is much more green. And of course, the number of buildings has shot up like mad. 
i am not even aware of that side you know on the side the pipeline side there are so many buildings which have come and after i left i think there must be even more buildings so enormous uh, increase in population as well as in uh, in terms of buildings students in our days the total number of students might have been uh, let me see see the uh, undergraduates would have been like 250 per year and there are five years right so total number of students might have been 3000 <laughs> so that is a number now it is really uh, maybe 15000 or something more then the undergraduate program was modeled on the i think probably mit or something of that kind heavy uh, quite a lot of instruction and a uh, lot of courses and so on uh, heavy lab work lot of drawing workshop and and the like all this has changed now it is far fewer courses which is the way i think it should be and the laboratories are very uh, focused laboratories in which the students actually learn and today students are also i feel far more sophisticated than we were in our days uh, it was a laid back kind of life uh, we came in without too much of competition uh, to iit nowadays i think to get into iit <laughs> is a random process i think even a very bright chap did not get in those days we could just walk in i think i remember uh, asking people about a week or two weeks before the uh, entrance exam where do you go to get these coaching classes and <laughs> things like that so that was the level of awareness in those days uh, i would say that the program was good for those days but um, heavy uh, journal writing heavy workshop and things like that and not enough uh, hands on experience where you actually build things and so on extra curricular activities were very very weak there were a few students who were very good Uh, i must mention for instance ramesh vadwani who is a an important donor not only for iit but for other institutions in the country he was our classmate and he was very good at uh, electronics practical electronics so he was a good hobbyist and there were like that maybe half a dozen in our department i remember that they built a wireless receiver and they were actually transmitter receiver and they transmitted and the police came and uh, <laughs> took away the <laughs> set i remember that and badwani was involved in that nowadays of course uh, hobbies club and things of that kind the versions of it available are immensely sophisticated and the total number of students involved in such activities is great and there is a large number of students who are interested in subjects for their own sake i i mean the kind who build things whether it is algorithms or hardware there is a large number of students so there are students which of whom i know uh, by the way I, during the period 19 i have been often involved with this uh, hobby club kind of type of thing i was never a man who built things on my own by i admired others so i encourage other students to be involved in this and i remember in our department some of us Uh, for instance juzarwasi myself and others used to keep labs open uh, in the evenings so that students can come and work on their own this we did for some years but what would happen is a few years it will run and then the student interest will die down so the one of the batches which was very interested was the 1984 batch 1984 batch has a number of students uh, who have now become faculty members in our department professor madhav desai professor mahesh patil professor uh, priti rao and there are others in other departments cs and so on so that uh, batch i remember was very interested and we kept the lab open and so on but after some time you'll find succeeding batches gradually lose interest and nothing happened but uh, from late 90s onwards we systematically encouraged this kind of thing and i was a mentor for such groups for about uh, up to 2012 or something like that i was involved with these people and although i myself never built anything i admired others and my admiration for these students must have encouraged them a little bit i think so i was involved with that and i am very happy to say that the you know the kind of character who in his room which he will be sharing with another person who will have his own lab in the room now this is the kind of thing that i would like to see in iit and 
I think there are examples of it. So that is the good part. Of course, there are lots of uh, bad things also. I won't go into details about it. But there are bad things. And but I don't want to say that these bad things happen only now. Even in our days, uh, our department, our uh, hostel itself was a fairly serious hostel. But other hostels, bad things were going on with students. I won't go into details. You know, the kind of uh, bad habits that they get into. So that was going on even in those days. The peak was between 1969 to 74. When I was doing PhD, I think the situation was not very good among students. You know, the substance abuse kind of thing that was going on quite a bit. It is still there in the institute, but not to the same extent as it was in those days. So those are some of the issues. So what should I say? The students are very much more sophisticated. The program, I think, is very well tuned so on. And uh, the involvement with postgraduates after the mid 80s in our department has been excellent. Until then, uh, IIT was largely catering to undergraduates. It was, I would, in a sense, obsessed with undergraduates, I think. They were very good, of course, but all the effort were going in there. And the students were not coming for our own MTech programs and, and the like. But that changed in the 80s. And now our uh, MTech and PhD programs are excellent. And I think the department as a whole is probably one of the best engineering departments in the country. And in many ways, it can match uh, uh, top ranking US universities. You see, the way the uh, international rankings go, funding and so on play a role, I think. And you find some ridiculous kind of comparison, some very new IIT being compared or ranked higher than IIT Bombay. These are actually examples of things going badly wrong in the ranking system. Uh, I would rank IIT in the top uh, 20 or 25 of American universities. It is of that level. And in some things, it is in the top 10 or so. Like microelectronics, uh, they are definitely very, very good. The funding has concentrated, uh, been concentrated in our department in the country. And I think they, we have delivered the goods. So that's one of the very positive things. So these are all uh, things, good things that have happened. And to a large extent, I should say that the entire country, the student sophistication has gone up compared to us. Uh, it's a bit unpleasant to be a student now. You have to work like anything. You have to go to coaching classes and so on. But they are very good. I would say that uh, they were, we were not as good, as sophisticated. We might have been better in some other respects. I like to think like that, but I don't know. <laughs> To summarize, what are the things? The students, very large number now. IIT is an excellent place. Don't look at the ranking, uh, international ranking some stupid organization gives. Uh, I'm telling you that they compare well with top ranking universities in the US. And the students are good. Extracurricular activities, particularly of the technical kind, is excellent. In sports, we may not be all that good. And I think we probably are very good in arts. But arts I regard as a rival for interest in technical things. So I don't go there too much. Sir, it is very nice to hear your very deep insights about you know, various aspects of the Institute in six decades of your association. So for the benefit of our viewers, uh, could you please name professors from the Department of Electrical Engineering from the time of you having been an undergraduate? Okay, I'll name some people. Uh, Professor Bedford taught us. I would say that he was the most impressive of the professors we encountered as undergraduates. Uh, Professor Bedford, Professor Hariharan. Another person who was an extremely important figure in our undergraduate days was Professor M.S. Kamath, who used to teach circuits he used to teach uh, transformers, he used to teach machines. He was a brilliant lecturer, but his exam papers were extremely hard. And that's what he is known for. And uh, his vivas were also regarded as very hard. So I remember, you know, it's a kind of uh, joke, which is popularized. But uh, one of these persons who's an alumnus who has done well and probably was CEO of Citibank or something like that. I forget his name, uh, he was saying that, what do I care about mergers and this and that and so on? I have handled 
M S Kamath Bhaiwa. So <laughs> he, in fact, he didn't handle it well. <laughs> so I suppose <laughs> the merger he handles it better now. So that's the way it was. What else? Uh, Professor Anjanelu also taught us. I think these are the names that come to mind in our department. Professor Mukherjee was around, but he did not teach us. Uh, there were some other figures, but uh, since they did not teach us, I don't remember them too well. In maths department, the most important person for me was Professor Vartak. I have attended courses by him. As an undergraduate, I had heard of him. Uh, and uh, I went to him and requested him in my final year whether he could be my guide for PhD and so on if I were selected. And he very kindly agreed. He encouraged me and so on. That was very nice. Uh, he was known for teaching a very large number of courses with no preparation and beautifully. So he will teach something like three courses in a semester. And then somebody from, let's say, mechanical engineering department or civil will come and ask for another 15 lectures on maybe something related to fluid mechanics or structures or something of that kind. He would not hesitate. He will go and give those additional 15 lectures also. So never say no to anybody and always cheerful, always kind. The thing that you remember about Vartak is his kindness. He was my uh, advisor and I have never heard him say a single harsh thing to me. Maybe I should have been disciplined a little bit more, but he was not the man to do it. So I remember him with great fondness. Very competent and, you know, very mild. You will never think that uh, a person, you are talking to a great man. That's very inspiring to hear, sir. Sir, would you have a message for students and IIT Bombay alumni watching this video? Yeah, uh, first of all, I wish you all the best, whatever you are doing. What I will wish you is enjoyment in whatever you are doing. That's what, that is something that can be expected. If you go about it the right way, enjoyment will come. And very often success will also come. But so aim at enjoyment. That's good. In Greek, get involved in whatever you are doing, you're going to enjoy it. That's one thing. And the uh, students who are just passing out, I may I request you, if you're going abroad, please come back. Uh, because I think our country does need uh, academics, does need technical expertise. And uh, of course, you get very impressed with our chaps who go there and become maybe big shots in some other university. And then they come back in a very big position here and people talk about him and so on. But they are not as valuable, I would like to think, as the foot soldiers, people like us who actually do the teaching and who actually do the influencing of students. Uh, so I would suggest that you please come back, even though you may have a much, quote unquote, brighter career abroad. You will not uh, lose in the process because if you are coming back, you must actually think of certain things as valuable. And those valuable things you will definitely get, even in India. Now, uh, people who are abroad, uh, who have settled down and so on, obviously they cannot now come back and it's not important anymore. But I wish them well, and I hope they think well of us and remember us with some affection. So that's it. Thank you. Sir, I now speak on behalf of the 1992 class of electrical engineering. Sir, we are extremely grateful for teaching, motivating, and inspiring us at a very impressionable stage of our lives. Your teaching has made a huge difference in our lives. Thank you very much, sir. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you and to my past students indirectly. It's been very nice. All the best to all of you. Thank you. So thank you very much, sir. It was really wonderful to speak to you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.